Okay, let's move a little bit to energy security. Some say that our dependence on foreign oil compromises our national security. Mr. Secretary, the United States has worked to improve its energy security by increasing domestic oil production and fostering new alternative energy initiatives. There have been some setbacks, however, such as the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. How does the United States balance its need for energy security with the economic and environmental consequences of accidents like the BP oil spill? Department of Homeland Security plays a critical role in two ways here. The response to the spill and the broader concerns of securing the associated energy infrastructure. Is the DHS doing enough in both instances? So, I mean, I think that the, the, the value from a security standpoint of having a stable um, form of energy production in this country obviously is not only that it makes us less dependent on threats to oil production overseas or the trans, uh, transit of oil across the sea lanes, but it has a, a very significant effect on our overall economy, which obviously has a security benefit. DHS is not, is not the regulator, doesn't set the terms and conditions. Obviously, you, want, you have to balance um, between two extremes. One extreme is pump everything without regard to um, any s safety or environmental concerns. Same thing goes with nuclear power. You, know, you could just you know, build without regard to the potential hazards. Or at the other extreme, you can say we're not going to do anything. And then we won't have environmental problems, but we'll be all freezing our you-know-what's off in the winter um, or sweating in, in 100 degree heat in Washington. So we clearly have to be in the middle. Uh, the two areas where DHS operates in this domain are these. One is, at least with a certain category of spills, uh, the Coast Guard does play the role as the principal agency in spill response. And I think people will go back and look at what happened with BP and ask, you know, they always ask, should the government have played a larger role? The typical model has been to let the operator, which has the technical expertise, play the lead role under the supervision and direction of the federal authorities. I think people will be reevaluating that, although I don't know whether in this budget environment we can afford to build up a federal capability to do um, spill response. The second level is how do we make sure that there's no uh, attack on our security, on our energy infrastructure? And there I would say, um, I don't think we worry so much about a physical attack, because we have pretty good security measures. I do think we need to look carefully at cybersecurity. Um, we do know that there are control systems in our energy sector and other sectors of our economy which are wired to the internet. And that means if someone can get <clears throat> past the firewall or somehow insert something into the network, they could affect the ability of that to operate and that could have environmental consequences. And that's why I think cyber is kind of at the top of my list of things which need to be urgently addressed by this country. Can I Left. make one point on energy, or maybe two quick points, but they're important. One is oil is a strategic commodity. The Western way of life depends on it. It is vitally important, and it has been for a very long time. Um, Hitler told his generals, if we don't get access to the oil of the, of the Caspian ba Basin, we will lose this war. That's what the Battle of Stalingrad was all about. It wasn't about Hitler wanting to build a villa in Stalingrad. He wanted that oil. Why did we fight in North Africa even before that? It was over oil. And, it's very, and you can make a very plausible case that the Nazis lost the war because they didn't have oil. In fact, in, in the Pacific as well, we were denying the Japanese oil. And they couldn't train their fighters, and that's why they couldn't. That, that, that's why we were able to do what we were able to do in the skies. That's one of the reasons they had kamikazes. Right now, if you ask yourself, where is Al-Qaeda getting its money? It's from the sale of oil in some way. We're, Iran's only important product, you know, a few pistachio nuts maybe, oil, 80% of its economy. We are fighting a war and we are funding both sides in this war. So it is absolutely necessary that oil becomes no longer a strategic commodity, but simply 
one of many competing energy sources. Now, one of the things that is helping our country right now is the fracking revolution. Hydraulic uh, fracturing is allowing us to bring a lot of natural gas, but all of this won't help until we, have, we can put more liquid fuels into our automobiles. This is not science fiction. It can be done right now, but we need to move very quickly to have a variety of liquid fuels so that the Iranians and the Saudis and others have to sell their fuel in a competitive market, and every time there's tension in the Middle East, the price of oil isn't, doesn't go up to a premium, which it does now. In fact, it stays at a premium because of the tension. And Russia and others, including Iran, anytime they want the price of oil to go up, all they have to do is increase the tension, and they get more for their product. It's a hugely important part of this war. We will not win this war so long as so much of the energy we need for our transportation system, just for that, not for other things, for our transportation system, comes from regimes that are hostile to us. Thank you. Let's uh, move a little bit to border security. One of the ways in which DHS works to improve our nation's border security is by pushing some of its activities into foreign countries. For example, the Security Container Initiative is a program where U.S. and partner country <coughs> customs officials work together to examine high-risk maritime containerized cargo at foreign seaports before the containers are loaded on board vessels bound for the United States. Mr. Secretary, in your opinion, is this an effective policy? Should it include more than just cargo coming into the United States? And are we doing enough to secure the land borders with our neighboring countries to the north and to the south? Well, I think, I think first of all, it has been effective to work with partners overseas to push the screening process out earlier in the supply chain. And um, we do it not only in cargo, but when I was secretary and the current secretary, uh, Janet Palatano, has continued this, we worked out arrangements with countries in terms of pre-screening passengers uh, before they get on airplanes, which is both a security benefit and also avoids the problem of somebody getting on a plane, showing up, and being turn back at the border and having to fly back again. So I think this has evolved and it's, it's actually a good thing. In terms of the land borders, um, we have put a lot of, uh, crossing the northern border um, between the ports of entry has typically not been a large flow of illegal immigrants. Uh, there have been issues about terrorists coming through the ports of entry. We've been pretty tough about the requirements for, for crossing from Canada through the ports of entry. We put in requirements for secure documentation. To be candid, the Canadians got a little irritated with me about this. Um, but they've accommodated to it and it has resulted in a real benefit to the security of the country. Southern border, people tend to look more at what's going on between the ports of entry. And there I have to say, if you look at the statistics, over the last six or seven years, for the first time, we're beginning to see a reversal of momentum and fewer people coming across, and the numbers are now getting, I think they're now lower than they were since 1970. Some of that is probably the economy, but candidly, some of it is uh, the investment we've made over seven years um, since I was secretary in increasing the infrastructure, the number of border patrol agents, and the technology at, at the border, and the current uh, uh, Secretary is doing the same thing. I mean, she's she's building on this. So I think this is again. It's it's. I, I don't want to tell you the job is done, um, but the move is in the correct direction. Thank you. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, uh, homeland security issues and on several topics, but let me ask you this. Given the threats faced by the United States, and the threats that are constantly changing, what do you see as the biggest threat we face going forward? Let me divide this into two parts. One is what is the most likely in the next short-term period of time? And I would have to say to you, and we've seen this, and we've had some near misses in the last couple of years, um, I think a terrorist putting a bomb in a mall or a bus station or taking a gun like Nadal, Nadal Hassan did in Fort Hood and killing people, I think that is the most likely thing we will see over the next few years. Uh, as I said, we had a close call in Times Square. Um, I think the enemy is continuing to try 
to find ways to do that. Now, is that an existential threat to the U.S.? No, although a series of attacks like that could start to have some real damaging impact on the economy. If I look at high consequence threats, not things that are necessarily going to happen next month, but that in the next five years could happen and would be enormously uh, damaging to the U.S., there are two things I worry about. One is a biological attack. We had a biological attack in this country. We had anthrax in 2001. The reason more people didn't get killed is that the perpetrator of the attack chose to deliver the anthrax, which was highly weaponized, um, in a way that limited the number of people who would be exposed. He sent them through the mail. If that person had dumped the anthrax in the New York subway system, you would have seen a lot more people get killed and you would have seen an unusable New York subway system. Um, the, the raw material <clears throat> to make biological weapons exists in nature. All you need is the know-how. So I worry about that, and I, and I think we've made some steps to prepare, but I think often uh, we are plagued in this country by the uh, characteristic that if something hasn't happened before, we don't get serious until it happens. And this is a case where one bite at the apple is really dangerous. The second area, as I've talked about already, is cyber, where I think uh, both in terms of our intellectual property and our control systems, um, we need to make a lot more progress in building defense capabilities. And this is an area where every individual um, and everybody who runs a business is going to have to take some responsibility because we're all linked together and we're only as strong as the weakest link. I'm going to, I'm going to agree with all that, but I'm going to answer your question in a slightly different way okay. and say there are two things that, that really worry me. And one is a failure of imagination on our part, the inability to foresee what the bad guys might want to do. Look, there was a blue ribbon commission on aviation safety just a few years before 9-11. They looked at all sorts of things that never occurred to anybody on this commission of very smart people, I could tell you their names and you'd know them, to say, you know what, somebody could use a plane as a missile and bring down a major building. They didn't think of that, even though people were using motorcycles and cars and boats. All of that had been used as delivery vehicles for terrorists. Nobody said, what if they used an airplane? Nobody said that. It's a failure of imagination. We are not exercising our imagination the way our enemies are. And here's the second thing I would say that I worry about, that we will lose the will to defend ourselves, our culture, our nation, our civilization, that we will choose appeasement, that we will choose the kind of delusion you heard from those people who went out of the room, that we will think that, we will think that there is some way in which we can make ourselves inoffensive to our enemies. And let me tell you, because I've known this since 1979, we cannot. Weakness is provocative. We will need to be strong and we will need to value what we have if we want to preserve it. Because in every, Ronald Reagan said that in every generation you have to fight for freedom. What he didn't say, but which is also true in the corollary, is that in every generation evil reinvents itself in a new way. So you had the Nazis who believed that the Aryans must rule and you had the communists who believed the proletarians must rule and now you have a group who say, you know, Muslims must rule, and we must rule according to our laws, and everyone is going to give way. We must believe in ourselves. Let, let, me, let me ask this question for each of you, and start with the, with the Secretary. Which is the greater threat, domestic terrorism or foreign terrorism? Well, you know, it's a, people separate them, but actually what the foreign terrorists are trying to do now is recruit American citizens and permanent residents and turn them into terrorist operatives. So I, I, I have a difficulty sometimes finding the line. And by the way, the kind of person who has got the mindset to become a terrorist can gravitate to one or another of the ideologies. And sometimes it's just the happenstance of where they happen to be roaming around on the internet. Right now, in terms of capability, and experience, international terrorists are ahead of domestic terrorists. I mean, I, they've had 10 years to hone their skills on how to build improvised explosive devices. Uh, they, for, until we went into Afghanistan, they were experimenting with biological and chemical weapons. Um, and they have more money and more resources, and they do get support from 
for example, the Iranians, and that makes them a more formidable opponent. But the hard thing for them is getting into the U.S., and what they are trying to do is take their know-how and somehow get it over to Americans that they can recruit to have those Americans be the delivery mechanism. And that's, I think, where you have the most danger. And I would structure it just slightly differently, Dean, and say that the terrorism we have to worry most about is terrorism and terrorist organizations that have state sponsorship. Groups that don't have state sponsorship have difficulty organizing, fundraising, getting into laboratories where they can make biological weapons, doing sophisticated cyber warfare, all of that is very difficult. You can't stop somebody easily from coming into this room and spraying it with gunfire or an improvised bomb. That can happen. But the kind of catastrophic terrorism that I think we really have to be concerned about, that requires some state sponsorship. That requires terrorists to be to have safe haven where they can work in peace and develop their cyber weapons, their biological weapons, their chemical weapons, their very intricate plots. It doesn't have to be a very sophisticated country. Al-Qaeda was able to do this in, Iran, in, Iran, in Afghanistan, which it was, a, was and remains a, a pretty primitive place. But if we can stop state sponsorship of terrorism, it's a different level of problem than if, than if nation states are providing the passports, the funds, the letters of transit. And, and, the, and the weaponry. I, have a slight, I, I slightly have a different take on it, which is it's not just state sponsorship. The, what we see now, which did not exist 20 or 30 years ago, is the existence of safe havens in failed states. These are countries like Somalia, now perhaps part of Mali, Yemen, where the central government is either weak or unwilling to really enforce the rules. You can't go so far as to say they're state sponsors. They're not necessarily funding the terrorists. But what they are is they're leaving an open field. And the terrorists have the ability then to use that safe space in order to build uh, their, their tools of destruction. And that's what, it, what has changed in the last 20 years, whether it's the frontiers of Pakistan or parts of Afghanistan or Yemen or, or Mali or Somalia, is areas where there is no lawful authority and no one has the will or the capability to police them. And that's why when we get into discussions about what the US role ought to be and whether we should be using lethal means to deal with these problems if the, if the country itself can't deal with it. Let me uh, close with one last question for each of you. Uh, uh, and you can think about it as I'm asking it. Uh, the first Homeland Security office was established by President Bush after 9-11. Uh, you weren't the first secretary, but you were the second secretary in that administration. Uh, we got a new president and President Obama, and he appointed Governor Napolitano to head Homeland Security, and so we've seen how it worked under President Bush. We've now seen how it's worked under President Obama, we have an election in November. Um, uh, as those of us who go to the polls go and to pick the president for the next four years, see if you can contrast how Homeland Security would look under another four years of President Obama versus how it would look under a President Romney. <laughs> Actually, I, uh, Cliff, you can start I th first. Look, I, actually, I think there are a lot of there. Are, look, there are a lot of differences between the, uh, a second Obama administration and a second Romney administration. This may be the least of them. I was privileged to have lunch with Secretary Napolitano earlier this week. She has great admiration for you, as you know. You like her as well. She is very clear that she has been building on the, on the foundation that you and Secretary Ridge had. When you talk about Homeland Security, it's not necessary, and you know this much better than I, so I should leave this to you. It, it, it is not, it's not that part. There are yeah. partisan issues, but this is, this is least of all, I think, a partisan, a partisan issue. The Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, there's a lot of things, but not this one. Not, we're, we're looking at best practices, and Secretary Chair to put in place a lot of best practices. What is the highest percentage of risk, and how do we focus most resources on that rather than a lower one? There's no disagreement among professionals in Homeland Security on these things. I, 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 I have to really strongly agree with that. I mean, I've, I've known Secretary Napolitano for years. We were U.S. attorneys together, and um, she's done a really fine job. 
And what has been notable about this is it has been not been a partisan or political difference in approaches. Um, there's been a lot of continuity, and I think it reflects the fact that when you sit in the position and have responsibility to make sure that really devastating things don't happen, uh, it really focuses the mind to, you know, uh, quote, is paraphrase Dr. Johnson, and, and people start to, you know, really focus on what actually works pragmatically. And there's also a large uh, group of career folks who are very, very dedicated to this. So to me, actually, I think a really good news story in the, in the 10 years the department has uh, existed, and, you know, it's had bumps in the roads, and there are things people don't like and things people do like, but it has not been a political issue, by and large. It's been a, a kind of a continuity of approach and a, um, an agreement on the importance of the objective that I actually think ought to make Americans feel good about it. And that also, I think, has generally been the case at levels between the federal, state, and local government. So my, my sense is that obviously there are always some policy differences on issues like immigration, but on the core of Homeland Security, I suspect that you're going to see a lot of continuity no matter who the president is. Uh, Mr. Secretary, from that awful day on 9-11, uh, thanks to Homeland Security and thanks so much for you, for your tenure, uh, America has been safe and we've continued to be safe. And, and we, know, we know the very minute we let up our guard, uh, we might not be safe. So thanks for what you've done to keep us safe, and uh, thanks for all who work with you. And let's all pray that for the rest of our lives and the lives of our kids, we continue to be safe. Amen. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for moderating.